So our first speaker, I'd like to welcome Tiffany Longworth. She will be talking, come on up. This is Tiffany. Tiffany will be talking about the change management for humans. And we're real excited to have Tiffany up here. Give a warm round of applause for, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Columbus. Hi. I, yes, I am Tiffany Longworth. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a sysadmin at Puppet. Uh, but I've not always been a sysadmin at Puppet. When I started, I scheduled the consultants and quickly automated myself into boredom. And so my boss was like, hey, how would you like to implement some software? And not knowing I was supposed to say no, I said yes. Uh, and this led me on a career journey that is just, I've been rolling out changes pretty much nonstop. Some of them have been great successes that I'm very proud of. Others have been catastrophic failures uh, at, that have left me emotionally scarred. And this talk is all about sharing what I've learned so you don't end up with the same emotional scars that I have. Because we're in IT. Change is constant. Uh, you roll out a thing. Hopefully you get to iterate once or twice, but all too soon we got to rip it out and replace it with something new because the business has pivoted. When this works, it is so beautiful. Like, raise your hand if you've gotten to roll out a change and people have been happy about it and that has made you happy. Like, it's really fulfilling. What about when you try and roll out a thing and it doesn't work though? It's the worst. Like, the people rolling out the change resent the people who aren't adopting the change. The people who are resisting the change don't even understand why this is coming down and ruining a perfectly good thing anyway, which means that we end up with subverted processes and shadow IT and, like, everyone's miserable and the thing that we were trying to fix doesn't actually get fixed because of all this, which means in six to 18 months, we're doing the exact same thing again, only we have less patience for one another. Uh, so. Just as there were a bunch of nerds that like computers, there are nerds that like change management. And they have several different frameworks that they use to predict whether or not a change is going to be successful. The one I'm going to use is called ADCAR. It is an acronym for Awareness, Desire, Knowledge, Ability, and Reinforcement. This is shorthand for people need to be aware that a problem exists before they're willing to change. They need to have enough desire to fix it. Like, if we can duct tape it, do we really care? Uh, they need to know how to fix their problem, have the ability to fix the problem, and they need to be reminded, because we are all human, and this is a talk about humans. To be clear, this talk is not about how to shove a terrible change down someone's throat. It's about how to create a good change that people go, ah, I see the obvious benefit and will gladly go along. So, the first part of communicating a good change is making sure you've got a good change to deliver. And this all starts before with your stakeholder interviews. Uh, this is my favorite part. Uh, that first project that I worked on, our problem set was that sales used one tool to store customer data, support logged all their customer stuff into a second tool, and then our consultants were put using yet a third tool to store information. So in order to get a picture of a customer lifecycle, you had to go into three tools, which was not cool. Um, so the first thing that I did was I had I identified my stakeholders. Everything you change impacts other people. Find out who they are and have an informational interview with them. This is purely inter informational and ask them open-ended questions about what problems they see, uh, what are their hopes and dreams in this problem space, what keeps them up at night. Uh, if you ask very direct questions, you're just going to end up with a bunch of confirmation bias, so be very, very open and write everything they say down. They're going to come up with some stuff that you never would have imagined. Uh, and some of it's going to be super important. And other things are going to be like pie in the sky dream time. Put it down anyway. Because while you're actually rolling out, while you're building your change, you might go, oh, here's an easy thing that they didn't think we would be able to do. And you get, it's like bonus points. You get like plus five charisma on your change initiative. Uh, 
When we're rolling on a change, a lot of times we already know what we want to do. Keep that to yourself. If you already know what their problem is, don't tell them. Let them tell you. Give them a sense of ownership. And also do not make promises, especially if you're having several stakeholder interviews. Don't be like, oh yeah, we can totally do that, because you might talk to someone later, and it turns out that they have needs that if you do one, you can't do the other. So don't make promises. Surprise them later with how amazing your change is going to be. Uh, Again, going back to ADCAR, this is building up your awareness of the problem space so you can communicate with examples that are meaningful to your audience and also figuring out what they desire, like what is their dream life look like. Uh, speaking of not making promises, be sure that your project can be fallible. Like if it's going to cause people, if it's going to cause more harm than good, you shouldn't launch it. That's a bad change. You should be making people's lives better. So uh, ask people for direct examples of what are things that if we break this, they will just hard pass on your change. All right. And then you want to follow up with them early because it's the real world and we cannot get everything we want. Come back to them and say, hey, that thing you wanted, we did it and we did this thing and this thing. But that third thing, that fourth thing, I can't count, it's too early. We wanted to do this and we heard what you said. Make sure they know that you heard them and then explain the reasoning why. What were the trade-offs that you had to go through? Uh, if they understand the business logic behind your decision, they will be more likely to go along with you and you will create evangelists as opposed to enemies and guess which one you want. Uh, seek consensus, be sure, like, are you still okay with this? Here's some workarounds maybe we can do. Get them to be on your side even if you can't give them a perfect uh, idealized version of your project. Okay. Uh, Oh, and even if you were gonna do that thing, implement that one feature that they asked for, give them credit. It's like IKEA furniture. Like, let them have a piece of ownership. They will be more invested in ensuring your change is successful if they got to have an influential part in it. Uh, oh. Look out for new stakeholders. Uh, that very first project that I did, so, the tool that the consultants used was our wiki, and it was old, and it was slow, and everybody hated it. And so the tool that we were gonna roll out was going to replace this, and I was like, oh, this is an easy win. Everybody hates this thing. We'll just have a new one. This is gonna be a piece of cake. Uh, but it turns out, not just sales support and consultants were using the wiki, everyone was using it. Engineering, HR, like everyone. And I didn't go and include them in this change effort, which meant that I missed out on the fact that they were already working on replacing that wiki. And like that change effort, event, in the end, didn't succeed because I did not analyze all of my stakeholders again because the scope had changed. So don't end up with that emotional scar. Okay, so you've done your homework, you've created your project, you've run it by your stakeholders, everyone's on board, it's time to launch. Start with the tigers. What are the absolutely terrifying things that are going to happen to us if we do not go out along with this change? You're really going for emotional impact. Now, I know we're all computer nerds here and feelings can be kind of weird and you might even be thinking to yourself, won't that make me be emotionally manipulative? No, we're, we're humans. We have feelings. Uh, pretending they don't exist is illogical. We're kind of like a compiled language. We need an emotional jumpstart to compile the code for your change. Like, if you don't start with a reason to change, people are gonna zone out. So, start with something that's impactful to them. Uh, charts are nice, but charts are kind of logical think more visual. So instead of just saying, look at this chart of how much money we will save, say, each of these Hot Wheels toys is the price of a Tesla. Here's how many Teslas we're wasting. Something like that. Give them something that they can be like, oh man, I just saw a car. It reminded me that I need to make that change. That 
that Tiffany said I should make. Uh, much like tigers, pain is a really good motivator to change what you're doing. Uh, you can use recent pain. So for that first change that I did, I said, hey, support, you remember that time you spent two days debugging this one weird module when the uh, consultant had already fixed that? And if you had just known what everyone else had done, you wouldn't have wasted all that time? That's really good pain. And that's an emotional argument. Remember that time when it really sucked? That's an emotional argument. Uh, other people's pain is also great. Hey, look what happened to Equifax. You don't want that to happen to you, right? Like, really good motivator. Changes in compliance, GDPR, ACA, uh, competition is your competitor coming for your lunch. And my personal favorite is a misalignment with self-identity. Hey, we're an automation company. Why is it that we have these manual steps to do that? Doesn't that make us kind of like hypocritical? Does anyone want to be called a hypocrite? Does anyone get like weird feelings in their stomach if they think they might be considered a hypocrite? That's why this is such a good argument. Um, now, after you've pointed out the tigers, we also need good, shiny, happy things. What are the puppies and kittens that lay in wait in our post-change future? Again, you're going for emotional impact. As much as I wish that people really cared sincerely about data quality, they don't. What they really care about is going home on time without a lot of stress because they didn't have to stay late reworking a project for an angry client because the first time you did it, the data quality was bad and it failed. So paint the picture for them of going home on time, happy, well-rested. Uh, maybe your change will mean that they have less work, easier work, more interesting work. And, uh, I really need to come up with a better phrase than continued employment because I don't mean like do it or I'll fire you. It's, I've never had that power, but it's more like if we do this change, our company is going to be more viable, which means that we won't go out of business and you can continue hanging out with all your coworker friends and life as you know it will continue. Uh, don't, this only works if you like your job. Uh, Greater good, so if it's a green initiative, the planet, if it's helping your community. And then, again, that self-identity. The tool that we rolled out was a, like, if, if Wikipedia and Facebook had a business baby, uh, that's what we had. And so I was able to say, like, hey, we're all really fun people here, and we enjoy hanging out with each other. If we roll out this tool, not only will we have clear pictures of what everyone's experiencing with us, we'll also be able to organize Magic the Gathering tournaments and karaoke outings and like all these things that we love and they're like, oh, that, that, that's pretty nice. <laughs> We're fun people. Okay, you've pointed out the tigers laying in wait. You have guided people to the glorious puppy-laden future. Now and only now do you get on to the details. Never, ever start here. If you start here, people will zone out, fall asleep, panic. None of this is what you want. Uh, one of, okay, so one time my manager said, Tiffany, we need to move uh, most of the department from this side of the building to the other side. Can you make that happen? And I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 I can do that. Um, I've got a military background, so it's just like, yes, I will make the change happen. Uh, and so I made the optimal plan. I found the optimal layout. I found out how we were going to, like, you move first, you move second, you move third. This way we don't have any clogs in the hallway. And I sent this beautiful detailed email out. And everyone went, but why? And I went, because we were told to? Uh, and people freaked out, like they had emotional attachments to their space in the building. Like there was a tree and a very specific bird landed there every day and they were friends with this bird and I couldn't like break that bond by giving details. So, don't start with the details. Uh, we Has anyone ever seen someone try and start with like, we've added a drop down menu to Jira please use it to record the origin of your bug. And then like, it's not, it's not like people don't understand how to use a drop-down menu, they just don't care. 
six months later, people are like, what is this drop-down menu? And then you get the, like, the Death Star Jira trap. Uh, okay, oh, right, so a lot of us here are really, really good at reading the docs. Um, it's how a lot of us were raised, but it's not the best way for all of us to learn. So while you're doing this knowledge step, try and take into account other learning styles. I usually write my docs while I'm rolling out a tool, which is easy, but then, like, how do we help people who learn best by listening? How do we help people who learn best in group activities or hands-on stuff? These are way, oh, yeah, yeah, for you visual learners. Uh, you don't have to do 20 different ways of teaching a thing to reach people with different learning styles. One of my favorites is when I launch, I have a class. So I'm going over the same docs that I've written. It's like they, they could read them, but I'm using my voice and I'm walking them through. And they're like, I can hear this. I can learn better because I'm hearing it. Oh, we're actually practicing. I learn best by hands-on. I'm getting to do this in an, in an place where I can get immediate feedback. I'm also, people who learn best in groups enjoy this. People who learn best on their own appreciate that I'm recording this class and making it available to them online later. Uh, like, I just hit almost all of that. Try doing a class, it's great. Um, third step, ability. People need to be able to apply your change. Uh, a really good example of not having the ability, even though you know how to do it, is if your manager says you can't. Make sure that management's okay with you rolling out your new tool. Um, scars. What people, change is hard. People are used to what they're doing every day, and they might be afraid of your change. You might be introducing something really intimidating to them, or even if you, it's pretty easy, they might be intimidated anyway because of past things that have happened to them. Give them an example of someone that they trust that has done this. Say, you want to be like Mike. Mike has done this before, and it has worked for Mike, and it'll work for you too. Let them know uh, that they're not doomed to failure. The more you can describe this uh, in detail, like it's not just Mike shoots and scores, it's Mike dribbles, Mike looks, angles, like give a playbooks, tell a story. The more someone can envision themselves doing these steps, the stickier it's gonna be in their brain, which means it's going to be easier to remember. That being said, the simplest changes are the easiest to do. Uh, in change management parlance, this is called clearing the path. Remove every ounce of friction from someone getting from point A to the end of your change as humanly possible. Uh, fiddly bits, secret handshakes, toggles, these are all friction. Make this as smooth as you humanly can. Uh, Make sure management can do this. And my favorite part of this is subverting imposter syndrome. Uh, there was, because again, people, one reason people don't change is because they're afraid that they might not succeed. So one change I did, we chose a tool because it was just dead simple to, for the end user to log in, do what they needed to do and get out without having to read docs, without having to talk to someone to get help. Uh, it, except for this one page. This one page was like time transported from 1996 and then turned upside down and then beaten. Uh, like it, oh, it was bad. And we knew it was bad, but it was only for this small subset of people. So they already knew if they had trouble, go to our wiki and find help. So that page started with, it's not you. You're here, <laughs> it's not you. Here's a gif of a baby monkey. Please look at it as long as you need to because we believe that you've probably wasted five minutes hating life. And then after that, we walk through all the secret handshakes and toggles. Don't let people feel bad about themselves for using your tool. If people feel bad about themselves for using your tool, they won't use it. Uh... Hooray, we have launched our change. People are aware of the tigers. They know about the puppies. They know how to roll out the thing. They're able to roll out the thing. We're done, right? Again, with that Jira dropdown, sometimes you roll out a change and everyone knows how to do it and they just don't. It's because we are human and we need to be reminded that there is a change that we're supposed to do. So, uh, 
we're DevOps, we like measurements, and measurements are also really handy because you can say, here are the results a week later. We're going up and to the right. This is your right, right? All right, so yeah, you're sending out some measurements, but you're also saying, remember that change we did last week? And people go, oh yeah, I'm supposed to do that, aren't I? I wanna be part of that up and to the right. Uh, you can also get this with iteration, like commit upfront to iterate on your project. Take those initial stakeholders that you interviewed and schedule things with them before you even launch so that you can go through and be like, okay, what did we get right? Help, help me groom my backlog. Like, what are the features we should do next to get the biggest wins and the highest adoption rate? And every time you say, hey, we heard you, uh, we improved this thing, it goes, one, hey, you remember that change we rolled out? And two, hey, I care about you. Like, your happiness is important to me, which makes people go, oh, I am liked. I like this person back. I should maybe do this change. Um, Follow-up checks, if you have the ability to see who's logged on or something, go do that. Follow up with the people who haven't logged on. Or if you need to build a pipeline, what teams haven't built their pipeline yet? Talk to them. They might be afraid, they might be busy. If either one of those is the answer, offering help is the way to fix that. Offer help. Da -da 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 -da. Onboarding, new people are a font of enthusiasm. They are eager to provide value, and if your onboarding documentation allows them to provide value very quickly, you will make a huge fan. And a huge fan is going to talk about how awesome your change is and remind all the people around them that they should do your change. Hack that system. Use new people to spread enthusiasm. And then if you have the power to end-of-life support for a previous way of doing things, do that, because there is nothing better at making someone not do the old way than for them not to be able to do the old way. All right, okay, if you're into summary slides, now's your chance. So what have we talked about today? Ad car, uh, when you're rolling out a change, make sure that people are aware of the tigers. Make sure that they know what the puppies are and that they are meaningful puppies to them. Uh, never ever start with the knowledge, but make sure that it's varied and clear. Uh, make sure that they have someone, that they, a clear success story to follow and remind them, because we are all human. If you have enjoyed this topic and would like to read more, here are three books that I have found extremely useful. Um, I'm gonna count for more photos because I don't really have anything else to say about this slide. Uh... Okay, and finally, this has been Change Management for Humans. I'm Tiffany, thank you so much for letting me come back to Columbus, and I love you all. Okay, bye.